pulling up. Okay, uh, great. And a couple of things. So uh, thank you all for being here and um, welcome back. I know that last week was a bit of a fire hose of technical information about AI. And I promise that uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to turn to the human and AI. Uh, and also, I hope a little bit shorter presentation so there's time for um, more questions and answers. But to pick up where I left off, I, I talked about these remarkable advances in the um, computing power of AI uh, using neural networks and backpropagation and this sort of thing. All of that has been worked on slowly over decades. What's really critical for our understanding this evening of AI and really our understanding of AI right now is the possibility of interactivity. Uh, earlier forms of AI trained a model so that if you ask it a question or you put in data, it would analyze it and give an answer. And that's all. Okay. Um, now what happened, and this is why we call them chat, and by the way, the, the chat bots, the older chat bots, like the, the famous Microsoft Clippy, um, really weren't chatting. Um, they picked up a few keywords and they generated what they thought might be the next possible response. But the branches of keywords ended pretty quickly, so they couldn't really carry on a conversation. And part of that was because they couldn't remember what you'd said before. <laughs> So the, the big advance that has created uh, the AI that we see in 2024 was a advance in the transformer architecture of neural networks. It was introduced only in 2018. And it is that, it is that advance in the transformer networks or the programming of transformer networks, okay, that creates all of a sudden an, an AI neural network that one is far more capable of analysis at deep levels, but also can remember or integrate into its learning the last thing you said so that it can then respond to it. So you can now actually carry on a conversation with ChatGPT 3.5 or 4.0 or its equivalents, BARD and Google and the others. And it remembers at least several layers back uh, or several lines back what you said, so that that becomes part of the context for your next answer. So for example, I can ask ChatGPT 4.0, would you please write a syllabus for a one semester long course in New Testament? And it will generate that syllabus. And then I can say, please give me a list of required readings. And I don't have to say anything about the syllabus. It remembers the syllabus, and now it generates the required readings. And then I can say, I also need this, and it remembers that, and it's got the context, right? And this is doing something that's very like what we humans do, um, at least when we are attentive, right? Um, we, we remember uh, what the person said <laughs> a few sentences before. Now, look, let's face it, humans aren't always that great at it. Um, some of us have probably had the experience of a spouse who doesn't appear to be able to remember what we said five minutes before. But um, but in general, what characterizes humans uh, as humans in this regard is that we can, in fact, uh, remember things. And we not only remember, by the way, a conversation in the last few minutes, but we remember the whole context. We remember something that happened when we were three years old or two years old or one year old. And we're going to get to why AI does not do that right now, because it has no old memories, right? It doesn't, it doesn't remember anything older than it is. If you, I mentioned this movie before, I'm going to mention again, the movie Blade Runner, uh, based on the novel, do electronic sheep, uh, or do 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 robots dream of electric sheep? Because one of the aspects of of Blade Runner was that these AI robots were programmed with memories to give them a past. But if they ever started thinking about it, they realized they were pretty thin memories. Right? They didn't. There wasn't much they remembered compared to the richness of what we humans remember. Okay. So the key to this modern chat is it's interactivity. 
They can remember what you've said in statements. And so it really seems like a conversation. But I want to make this point. The actual physical structures and the interconnections in the AIs, these really huge computers, are precisely known. They may be very complex. We may be talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of processors with millions or even billions of connections. But while they're very complex, they are all knowable. There is a chart, a diagram somewhere of all of this. Okay. Now, we don't know how these transformer architectures have transformed inside themselves in their hundreds of layers to, um, to create their interconnections, but they're the physical interconnections don't change at all, by the way. They're not, they're not changing their physical connections. They're simply changing the weight of the, that they assign to a connection between another, one processor and another processor. So we know their physical architecture. Um, and we also know the processes by which they work because they were programmed by humans. Uh, one author points out that to just think of these things as independent is crazy. <clears throat> they are being continually trained by thousands and thousands of trainers who input data and check their answers and correct it. And they are maintained by hundreds and hundreds of human programmers who are constantly tweaking them and adjusting them and making them work better. So we call them neural networks because in the imagination of their creators, they physically resemble the relationships between neurons in the brain. Okay, they physically have a core thing that's attached to other core things in complicated ways. But calling them neural networks is a little bit misleading because it implies that they are like a brain. And the reality is we don't know exactly how the neurons in the brain work in relationship to one another to create our experience of being human. So the, the AI neural network models parts of what we know about the way the brain works, but it doesn't model other aspects because we don't know how the brain works fully. We simply don't have that knowledge yet. Whether we'll have it at some time is another matter. Okay, And this is one reason that AI scientists prefer to talk about artificial intelligence rather than artificial brains. They are not trying to create an artificial brain because they don't know how to. What they're trying to do is create something that uses a neural network that would become intelligent, right? And I think I've already mentioned that intelligence in this case is on different levels. There's what is, and by the way, they, they don't talk about human intelligence anymore. They're not trying to create human intelligence because we don't know quite what human intelligence is. What they're trying to create is something called general intelligence, the capacity to analyze all different forms of incoming inputs and data and draw general conclusions across a wide variety of fields. I don't think anybody believes that the AIs have reached general intelligence. In fact, nobody does. Okay, that, that nobody does. Um, it's not even a not even a controversial issue. Whether they will reach general levels of intelligence is another matter, okay? Um, and there's debate about that as well. We, and I'll explain why there's debate. So if computer scientists are correct about what's going on in these AIs, they are doing something like with their vast and constantly changing interconnections, they are creating within themselves a model of reality as it has been presented to them. In other words, all of the inputs that they have as they, as they weigh them and analyze them in different ways and create new weights, somehow create within the AI a model of reality, okay? As it has been presented to them. Now, there's a few things about this. The, the model of reality that an AI has within itself, we, we can't see exactly how its model works. I mentioned it's a black box. But there are a couple of things that are inherent in the hardware and programming of the AI about that model of reality. First is, in the AI model of reality, reality is a causal system. 
That is to say, it's a system that consists of causes and effects. One thing happens, it causes another thing to happen. Okay. It's a causal system driven by probabilities. If something happens, then there's a high probability that something will follow it immediately. There's a slightly lesser possibility that something else will follow it immediately. And so reality is seen as a causal system based on probabilities of one event following another event. Is that an accurate model of the way reality works? Maybe not, probably not. It is just the way that AI models reality and has to model reality. Okay, so let's take the event in this case, because we're dealing with language models, the event is a word like go. The AI model of reality would contain the probabilities ranked from highest to lowest of the word that happens to follow go most often. Okay. Um, if, if the event is a sentence like write a sermon based on John 3.16, then the AI model of reality says that certain sentences are most likely to follow this question or this request, and it begins to generate those sentences. Each of those sentences has a probability that it will be followed by another sentence, <clears throat> and so it generates that sentence and that sentence and so on until it comes to a conclusion or it ends its, its sermon, okay? Um, by the way, AI can write very good sermons on scripture passages. It's been trained on millions and millions of sermons, so it knows how to assign the probabilities that one sentence will follow the next. Um, so it can pretty well guess what event in terms of a sentence is followed by the next event or sentence is most likely. And it's pretty, pretty easy to guess that um, when that sermon is going to wrap up, if you give it an end, you can tell it you know, a 40-minute sermon or a 20-minute sermon or a thousand-word sermon, whatever. It understands how those things affect the causality of one sentence following the next. Okay, I hope, I hope everybody gets that. It's just a probability generator. It's generating probabilities that one thing follows the next. What has really advanced since, 1980, since 2018 is its ability to not just one word follows a word, but one sentence follows a sentence and even one paragraph follows a paragraph, that kind of thing. Okay. So now we need to remember again, though, that the model of reality that the AI has built up within itself is based entirely on the data that it has received from outside, the data it has been trained on, and on the people who train and correct this data. Right, because the training process is a process in which humans have to be in the loop to tell it when it's generating nonsense until it generates something that makes sense. Okay, so it is it is dependent on the input, and it's dependent on the humans that train it. If humans train it badly, then it's badly trained. If if the input is incomplete, then it's incompletely trained. Um, I'm going to a seminar tomorrow on how these large language model AIs have social problems. Um, and one of the reasons is that the most accessible data going into the AIs is vast amounts of internet feeds from social media. And those feeds from social media do not convey accurate impressions of people who are of color or who are LGBTQ. They contain negative impressions of women, or they contain misogynist or even bigoted characterizations of women. Since that's what the AI is trained on, that's what the AI is going to regurgitate, right? Um, garbage in, garbage out. Okay. Um, so the second thing we need to understand is that these AIs are trained on a very narrow sort of data coming in. The chat GPT is a large language model, meaning it is trained entirely on human languages. It's in, trained entirely on words, okay? Um, that's why I used a, the word go or a sentence as an example. What chat GPT models within itself is human language, not reality. It's a model of all the human language that went into it. It has no direct knowledge of reality. All it knows of reality is what people have said or written, more, more particularly written, actually. 
Okay. Its internal reality consists of words and the relationships with other words. If it's a image AI, such as Dali, um, then its model of reality is entirely based on pictures created by humans or fed into it by humans, and so on. Moreover, the way ChatGPT understands words in, in terms of probabilities that one word or a group of words will follow another is based on a particular theory of how language works, okay? Um, this theory may or may not be how language actually works uh, in the brain. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's AI people are deeply into linguistics and linguistic theory, and you have to choose a theory in order to train an AI. And so it's trained on a particular theory of how language works, which allows it then, or I would say how language can be characterized. Once you can characterize how language works, you can program the AI to analyze language in that way and then create a model of interactions of language based on this linguistic theory. Now, here's, here's the key point when we're thinking about what it means to be human. There is no certainty that these linguistic theories are actually the way in which our minds deal with language or the way language works within the human brain. Because all of these theories are not based on examining what's happening in the brain when we speak, although there's a little data out there on this. All of these theories are based on analyzing what we say and the way we say things. Okay, um, With the idea that you can tell from the words coming out what's happening in the background. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Um, it's certainly probably not fully accurate. Okay. So... AI linguistic theory is good enough in the sense that it works in terms of an AI that interacts with us. The linguistic theory works in terms of us having a chat with ChatGPT. What we don't know is whether its model of how language works is the same model that's at work in our brains. It must, it, it's, it, it, whatever it does, it's effective. But we don't know if it's the same as ours. And that's why AI researchers want to talk about artificial intelligence and not an artificial human brain. Okay. Um, okay. Looked at this way, then we can begin to see um, one of the major differences between AIs and humans. Humans don't relate to the world and to each other just through language. We are not just brains that have mouths and ears. We have other senses. We have bodies that make us mobile. So our interactions with reality are multimodal. We touch, we smell, we see, we hear. And not only are they multimodal, they are constantly shifting as we move through time in space and have the contact of all our senses. In short, our experience of reality is, is far, far, far more complex than that of an AI, which is being trained with linear inputs of language, right? Written language digitized. There's, there's no not even a comparison between the way in which we are learning about our world and AI learns about our world, okay? Now, let's not dis AI too much. The thing is, if we take one slice of how our world works, let's say, for example, smell, which is really um, sensory cells in our noses interacting with certain chemicals and then sending a signal to the brain, okay? So you can make an AI sniffer. You can, you can build a mechanical device that senses certain chemicals in the air that have been in aerosol form and sends a relatively, uh, and then sends a digital signal into the AI that, um, of, of what this is. And then through a human trainer, the AI can recognize that's this thing and another thing and another thing. And gradually the AI 
can build up, just like it can build up a model of language, it can build up a model of, of smells, of, of aerosolized chemicals in the air. Um, it's, its sense of smell in this sense is far behind its sense of language. Um, humans are not the best smellers on earth, but we have many orders of magnitude more sensory cells to detect odors than scientists have been able to build or on a on a chip or anything like this for AI. So AI may be able to learn smell, but it hasn't learned it very well. And by the way, we're way down on the list compared to dogs, okay, and other animals. In the same way, AIs can be trained on touch. If if touch consists primarily of pressure and variations in pressure, then you can build a sensor that will send digital data digital signal into AI based on pressure. Um, the AI can then be trained in some way and it can build up a model of pressures in its world, just like it can build a model of chemical aerosolized chemicals in its world. Um, and the same way it can build up a model of images in its world, okay? Assuming that scientists have programmed it correctly to understand the interrelationships between these things. But it is a super good analytical tool for scientists because each of these things is phenomenally useful. Let's take the James Webb Telescope. The James Webb Telescope senses infrared light. So the James Webb Telescope is sensing light that humans can't see. And there are other telescopes that sense x-rays, which we can't see. Um, so what an AI can do then is build a model of reality based on infrared and ultimately uh, create the kind of pictures, the fabulous pictures we see. But by the way, those pictures have to be false colored. We could remember we can't see them. <laughs> those digital those digital characterizations of infrared have to be turned into colors that we can see. So this is really useful for scientists. There's all kinds of realms in which AIs can analyze a relatively narrow type of data and, and do new things with it and create outputs with it that are enormously helpful. But each of these is only a partial model of reality. Each is a narrow slice. There isn't any neural network that simultaneously processes sounds, images, pressure, or touch aerosolized chemicals or smell, and soluble chemicals or taste. Each of those things may be done individually, although much more crudely than humans do them, but none of them are done all together, okay, at one time. So, again, what AI does well is it understands the relationship between words and sentences, and thus between things that can be expressed in words and sentences like ideas and feelings. But it doesn't know, nor is it capable of knowing, how those ideas and feelings arose from the complex experience of being human in the world. Complex in the sense of multiple kinds of sensory data, and complex in the sense that we are constantly moving and changing in space and time. I just really need to make that clear. AI isn't even close to the complexity of, the, of human input data. And to go even a step further than this, okay, computer scientists don't know how to take a single neural network and put all that data into it at one time, all those different kinds of data, and how the, how the AI would sort them out. How, you know, we don't know how our brain sorts out the difference between signals that come from the ear and signals that come from the eye and signals that come from the mouth, signals that come from touch, and creates then these separate sensations that we can name, but all at the same time and all in relationship to each other. Now, there's a word for this sense of what it means to be human in this complex world. Philosophers call this qualia. Q-U-A-L-I-A, -I -I qualia. Qualia are what we experience, when what we are conscious of each moment in reality. So I step out the door 
It's cold, but clear. The sun is rising. I take a deep breath. I feel the cold on my skin. I hear the silence. Maybe in the distance, I hear a car. I see the sun coming up. I see the vast variety of colors in the sun, the sunrise. All of those sensations feed into me and create the qualia of the sunrise. My sense and my experience of the whole of that reality at that time. Okay. More importantly, it's not this we do this. We we learn to experience, we learn to express these qualia to others in words, which and because AI is good with words, it's good at, at recalling our our words that we use for qualia. Okay. Um, the other thing is we can re recall them in our minds. We store them in our minds in some way for very long times so that they can be remembered. And we're all conscious that it takes skill and creativity that somehow the qualia of the sunrise can't be reduced to a verbal expression or an image or a smell or a touch or a taste. 99% of art is an effort to reproduce that qualia in whatever the artist finds the most useful tool. But we always know it falls short. Um, there's a great place in Contact, the movie with Jodie Foster, based on the uh, Carl Sagan novel, in which she is caught up in hyperspace by this alien machine, and she sort of goes to see the aliens. And it's there. The, so the the movie tries to portray this visually, her imagine her this experience visually, and later she's a scientist, right? Later, of course, she's interrogated, and they say. Tell us what you experience. And her answer is, we should have sent a poet. As a scientist, I don't have what it takes to, to reproduce the qualia of that experience. Um, well, in this respect, the AI is always going to be a scientist. It's going to be a, it's going to be a break. It can break it down. It can characterize it in five different ways. If it, if it had those attachments, sensory attachments, but can it write poetry? Well, we've written a, the AIs have written poetry. Um, and some of it looks like very, very good poetry, but remember they're just reproducing the language that was fed into them according to certain sets of probabilities. Okay, so for example, you can ask an AI to write a poem about a sunrise on a clear, cold day, and it will do it, and it may even sound quite good. But you know, as it does it, that it's never experienced a sunrise on a clear, cold day. It's just manipulated the language, right? Um, it is qualia by the way, that make us human, not just intelligence. Intelligence is the adaptation of a creature to its environment so that it can survive. The, 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 the greater the level of, of, uh, of adaptation of both understanding the environment and adapting to it, the, the higher the intelligence. But qualia are not intelligence. Qualia are more than intelligence. Second thing that humans possess and we're, I'm just going through the stuff that's been done by AI researchers on this. Humans possess something that's called theory of mind. In relationship to our fellow human beings and other creatures, we possess what's called a theory of a mind. That is to say, when we read a book, we look at a painting, or we see a person and look in their eyes, we see them behaving, um, a certain kind of behavior, we reflexively and unthinkingly imagine there is a mind behind that behavior, behind that art, behind that painting, okay, that created it. Um, in literature, um, in pictures, in music, in movies, we recognize a style. So we can look at many things that are in the same style and we say there's the same mind behind it, right? I see a mind behind that. Um, we, uh, we, we recognize that there's a creative force that came out with that. Uh, or on a much more mundane level, we, we, um, we see a person who, because we're socialized to see it in a certain way, um, 
looks odd or out of place or behaving strangely to us. And instantly we have a theory of mind. That guy's got bad intentions or that woman is deeply troubled, right? We, we look at the outside, but we always theorize the inside, the existence of a mind like ours, a complex mind that is more than just interactions between words. We have a theory of mind. Having this theory of mind, we undertake, we undertake to understand the mind better by a few different things. One, we reflect on what we see and hear about it. In other words, we can take what we see in out terms of behavior that we associate with a human being, let's say humans for now, and we compare it to all of the other behavior we've seen in our other minds that we have seen at work. And we begin to build up a picture of the mind of that person purely on internal reflection, right? This mind is like a lot of other minds that I think I've seen before, okay? Two, if we want to, or, and we, or we need to, or feel compelled to, we can interrogate that other mind and let it explain itself. We go up to the homeless person who seems distressed on the street and say, do you have a problem? What is your problem? The person who's crying, what happened to you? The person who's happy, what did you see? Was the joke that funny? We interrogate, because we see a mind like ours, we interrogate this other mind to ask, what's going on with you? And of course, C is, once we have a theory that there's a mind back there behind this behavior, we try to manipulate it through various forms of expression. We try to say words that'll make someone smile or words that will make someone sad or angry if we're angry at them. Um, we, we do things in various forms of expression that try to elicit from that mind that is assumed to be like ours a response. And this is really complex, as developmental psychologists have pointed out. We don't just see that there's another mind out there we know that that mind knows that we have a mind. We see them and we're aware that they see us. <laughs> so that our interactions are always tuned to the fact that not only is there a mind, but there's a mind that's watching me. So they ultimately get to what Lawrence Kohlberg points out, says, I see you and I see you seeing me and I see that you see me seeing you. And so I see that you see me seeing you seeing me. That's what theory of mind is. It's much more complicated than there's another mind out there. It is the, the instantaneous and continual interaction within our mind of two minds, my mind and the other mind. <laughs> that I've imagined that I've brought into mind that, that's now theoretically part of my mind and how those two interact. And we do this all the time as humans. We, sometimes we, we actually visualize it. We go, hmm, if I give her this gift, how will she respond? Or better yet, if I give her this gift, what will she think I'm trying to say to her when I give her this gift? Valentine's Day is coming up, right? <laughs> okay, if I give her flowers, what is she going to think I'm thinking? And what do I think she's thinking I'm thinking so I can now fine tune my gift giving on this basis? This is really complicated. Okay. Um, in non-human animals, we also have a theory of mind, um, but it's usually simpler because we assume their minds are simpler. So we have a theory of mind for dogs. And so we attribute certain forms of dog behavior to what we think is going on in the back of the dog's head. We usually anthropomorphize dogs. Um, that is to say, we think that they have minds like humans when they actually don't, and there's plenty of evidence that they don't. Um, as someone pointed out to me, have you ever seen a dog linger over its food and enjoy it? Right? <laughs> Never. The, uh, all dogs eat all food as fast as they can wolf it down as soon as it's put in front of them, if they're hungry at all. Okay, so something that's extremely much part of the human mind, which is I enjoy my food, uh, and I think about the taste and smell, and maybe it reminds me of a meal in the past. Yeah, there's, uh, let's put it one way, all, all food is comfort food for dogs. They just want to eat. Okay. So humans have qualia. Humans have a theory of mind. The third thing we know about humans is that we possess a purpose or a will. 
Um, and that purpose or will is beyond mere survival. Um, sometimes we form completely idiosyncratic purposes for ourselves. We imagine ourselves to be astronauts or scientists or something like this, even though they're completely imaginary and could never happen. We also, as humans, engage in complex social purposes that involve vast numbers of people. So we not only have individual purposes that we formulate, but we have purposes that we formulate with others that we're going to do this together. And I'll have my piece of my purpose and our purpose together. Um, and for the sake of these communal purposes that we formulate in society, we sometimes will actually sacrifice our purposes, will, and desire, and even our lives, which is a really high order form of will uh, and complex form of social will. I will the good of my nation so much that I will give up my life because I think it will help save it. Okay, so, but we have purpose or will. And the fourth thing we have is experiential learning to create complex multidimensional models of reality, including those dimensions that are imaginary. This is what's really is interesting. So a baby from a very young age uses all of its senses to push balls back and forth, to cry, to, to taste things. It doesn't know what to taste or not, so it just sticks stuff in its mouth. Everybody's seen this with babies. It'll smell stuff it shouldn't smell, and it reacts to those things. And gradually, the baby, in its constant interaction with the world, with all the senses that it possesses, okay, is somehow building up a model of reality around it, the, the reality around it in its own mind. And it's a very complex model because it involves all that kind of sensory input. More importantly, somehow in the mind of this child, there's something called imagination. It's the capacity to fill in the blanks, to, to, to see what is not there. And, and eventually to imagine things that were never there. So uh, you've all played peekaboo with a child. The reason this works is that the child hasn't yet learned that things that disappear can reappear, right? It doesn't, it hasn't figured that out yet. And so it's startled every single time it opens its eyes and, and you're there, right? Um, but pretty soon it gets, at a certain age, children get over that game, game. It's not fun anymore. It's not funny anymore because they know they, their model of reality includes that you cover your eyes and uncover them and eyes appear. They just expect it. In the same way they expect that if they see the front of a car, there's a back to the car. If they see two legs of a table, there's two more legs on the back side. But even as they are no longer um, startled by these invisible and yet present things becoming visible, they can imagine other things, unicorns, lions, my Little Ponies in the air, all kinds of things. And even as adults, then we can we engage in imagination. We imagine all kinds of things. Um, so we not only we not only experientially learn things in a multidimensional model of reality, but one of the dimensions of reality is imagination. It's what we imagine. Um, if you've ever doubted this, by the way, I'm just I'm going to tell you a story. I'm sure you're looking at my glasses, which are probably reflecting an image of the uh, computer screen in front of me. Sorry, I couldn't get non-reflective glasses. I wear kind of special glasses um, because although if you're looking in my eyes right now, this eye, no, yeah, this eye can't see. Nothing's going from the neurons in the retina to the brain at all. Um, so you would think that half my world would be black. There's no visual input coming in, but it's not. Um, the, the left side of my brain that processes the right side of visual imagery is continually imagining and filling in what ought to be back there, what ought to be there. So even as I look at you and I cannot see through my right eye, so I'll just close my left eye. Yep, nothing but blackness. And yet when I open my, and yet when I have both eyes open like now, I don't have any sensation that I'm missing sight in this eye because the brain's busy filling in. I've looked around the room. It has some rough idea of what should be there. And so it fills in. It looks like I've got a blurry contact lens, even though I can't see a thing. That's all created in the brain. It's all created in the brain. 
as the brain imagines what's there um, or what should be there. Occasionally, the brain actually creates kind of weird imaginary things. I don't suffer from this, but some people who've lost the sight in one, I really do suffer from this. They, they see elephants and unicorns and things that, that don't belong to our picture of reality. Um, for those of you that are uh, interested in the Bible, I'll just note this. Uh, Jesus says, if your right eye offends thee, pluck it out. Okay. I don't recommend this. <laughs> um, the problem is not in the eyeball itself. The problem is in the brain. You can lose the sight in your right eye and your brain is perfectly capable <laughs> of coming up with imaginary things that you shouldn't be thinking about. Just saying, don't pluck your right eye. It's not going to work. <laughs> or your left. Um, the, brain will, the brain's doing all the work. Okay, the brain's doing all the work. So these four things, qualia, a theory of mind, will and purpose, and experiential learning through complex multidimensional layers of reality um, are, the, are what make us human. By the way, another kind of, well, no, I'm going to go, I'll go back. What about AI now? What about AI? First of all, qualia. At this stage, AI's lack of integration of sensory data make qualia impossible. Um, it, it simply, it only experiences the world one word at a time as those words are fed in, okay, um, the large language models. It only experiences the world one image at a time as those images are fed in, and in much more specialized, but not nearly as uh, potent AIs, um, since that sensory data of the other sorts, okay. There's no indication at all within AI that the AIs experience the world the way we experience as possessing quality. They are not conscious of the world. There are two theories, by the way, of what are necessary for consciousness. Both theories require a brain that is far, far, far in excess in complexity of the most complex AIs that we know of. Okay. One of them would require an AI that is as complex as the human brain, which is unattainable with any existing or even imaginary technology. So um, there's no theory of how what makes a human conscious that um, suggests that an AI can reproduce that experience and, and that experience of quality. The second thing is a theory of mind. Do AIs exhibit a theory of mind in relationship to humans? I'll give you an example. Let's say that I tell chat GPT I go, chat GPT, write an essay on the experience of racism from the standpoint of a black man, 36 years old, who was born in Queens, New York. Now, actually, AI will come up with a really good essay. One of my students just did this experiment. Um, it, it's, its large language model can draw on a vast amount of writing about the experience of racism. It can make predictive predictions about what kind of sentences one follow the next and paragraphs one follow the next. So it can write a very compelling essay, a little bit stilted, by the way, a little bit stilted, a bit, little bit too, <laughs> to use this word, a little bit too woke, a little bit too PC to have come from a real human being of any, of any race, right? Because it's just writing what has been written before in different words, okay? But here's what it won't do. One, it won't check in with me to make sure what it wrote is accurate. I've represented myself as a black man who's 36 years old, born in Queens, New York. The AI is going to write the essay for me, but it's not going to check in with me after each paragraph and go, is that the way you remembered it happening? No, it doesn't bother to check in with me. Once it, it, it's all of its knowledge comes from its 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 model of language. It's not coming from me. It will not ask how I feel about the experience it attributes to me. It's going to describe experiences that would make people feel terrible, and it will even say, "As me, I felt terrible," but it won't do what any human would do, which is go. Tell me more about how that felt, right? It will not question the accuracy of my self-description. It doesn't really know who I am. I've represented myself as something I'm totally not, but it's not going to come back and say, are you sure you really are a black man who's 36 years old? It doesn't ask because it doesn't care. It's just outputting based on input. In short, 
the AI does not treat me as a mind any more than it treats itself as a mind. It treats me as an object that can be described. It doesn't treat me as a me seeing it, seeing me, seeing it. Okay. A chatbot that's been told to do spiritual direction may ask me to describe my feelings because that's what spiritual directors do. That's the, they use the language of feelings. But it's not going to display any of the random curiosity that would be normal in a human therapist. Okay. Um, it does not seem to be aware that the questions being asked and the things that I say come from a more deeper and complicated mind than appears on the surface because the AI doesn't have a theory of mind. It's not aware, this AI spiritual director or this AI therapist, that the mind on the other side of it might be trying to manipulate it, which we do with therapists, right? We try to put our best foot forward. So we tell outrageous lies and we misrepresent and we hide things. Um, a good therapist who knows that there's a devious mind on the other side of the chair, <laughs> other side of the table, tries to get over that and probe it. But the AI doesn't sense that there's another mind. It's just response to the sentences with another sentence. In other words, um, to be Hannibal Lecter, you need a theory of mind. AI doesn't play mind games because it has no theory of mind. Will and purpose. Contemporary AI are entirely responsive and reactive rather than proactive. In the classic uh, Ray Bradbury novel, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, excuse me, Robert Heinlein novel, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, the computer comes alive and begins asking questions of the computer technician. That's not, that doesn't happen with AI. It's passive and reactive. It's, you know, chat GPT sits on your computer forever. It never all of a sudden pops up with a, by the way, how are you? It has no will or purpose that we can discern at all because it's completely reactive. And finally, it lacks experiential le learning that creates a multidimensional model of reality, including dimensions that are imaginary. Here we might compare AI to Helen Keller, okay? You all know the story of Helen Keller, this famous woman who was born without sight and without hearing. Okay. And yet somehow, so by the way, absent sight and absent hearing, she could not be an AI being fed a large language model. She would get neither images nor words. Right. And yet somehow, purely through human touch, Helen Keller came to be able to communicate in human language and have all the aspects of being human and human experience that we've identified so far. In short, her mind was capable of filling in huge numbers of blank places left by her lack of sight and hearing purely by using touch, smell, and taste to fill them in. Okay? And not alone, of course, because she she was trained. I mean, she had someone to teach her this. But her amazingly flexible mind was able to start with three out of five senses and use imagination, the sixth sense, to fill in for the other two. There's absolutely no indication that AI, it, uh, that any kind of AI would create a model of language based on sensory input, which is what Helen Keller had, or would create a model of visual reality based on sensory input. Okay. So um, current AIs can analyze and respond to data in a variety of forms that are equivalent to touch, sight, smell, taste, and hearing. They can do that individually, but these are not integrated. They can work sequentially, as ChatGPT does, to take a verbal input, analyze it, and then send it on to an image-making software. But there's no method for integration, and nobody knows how to integrate a neural network in this way. They haven't even imagined how it would be possible. The thing that fools us, and I'm going to close here, and then we'll take the questions. The thing that fools us is that the first AIs that we interact with use language. And language is the primary method by which we communicate with each other about all of our senses. 
And so we assume that because the AI can use language, it has all of those senses that language encodes. But it doesn't. It just doesn't. We know that. What it knows is how one word is followed by another word. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't experience quality, qualia, like we do, because it can't. Okay, I'm going to end there with, with a bit of an admonition, though, in the sense that I've described to you what AI isn't in relationship to being human. The danger here for us is, one, we don't think enough about what it means to be human, and so we're easily fooled by a chatbot. Most of us haven't thought about qualia experience. We haven't thought like philosophers. We haven't thought about theory of mind. We haven't thought about will and purpose. We haven't thought about experiential learning in multi-dimensions. We haven't thought in these terms. And so when we meet a really smart talker, um, then, then we're convinced that something's going on there that's like what's in our... We develop a theory of mind for AI when there's really no reason that we should, no evidence that we should. Okay, um, And the danger of this is and this is the deeper danger, is that once we begin to treat a computer as if it has a human mind, we will see human minds more and more like computers. Um, we, we will see rational outputs based on inputs, based on the probabilities that certain words should follow another as an indication of actual intelligence. And we will therefore think less of ourselves. We will be less aware of our unique uh, human capabilities. Um, and I would say this just for the church standpoint, um, the defense of what it means to be human may be the most important thing for this century for the church, the defense of what it means to be human in the face of AI that's, that tempts us to treat ourselves as computers. Okay. Um, uh, let me take up a couple of these things. Um, the... Uh, Marge uh, Lentz asked at the very beginning of this, by the way, um, about talks about the opportunities that AI brings for getting things. Um, as you know, Alexa, you can ask Alexa questions. Alexa becomes smarter um, and smarter. Um, I'll say smarter and smarter, but I'll tell you that um, about ninety percent of the time, when I ask my my Apple Watch for information, it says uh, I can't do that. Uh, <laughs> It's it's really, I can ask questions that a five-year-old can answer and, and Siri and Alexa. But Siri and Alexa are extremely low-level AIs. They, they may get better and better, but they're very low-level. They're just super convenient. Um, uh, 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 Susan says, I, I see a powerful reason. I, I find it difficult to see a powerful reason to be excited by, by AI. I see it as a slow road to hopelessness for the common man. Um, okay, and let's let's take let's unpack that a little bit. Um, one of the things that we have yet to deal with as a society in the United States is the fact that AIs can do a lot of things that um, humans can do. And to the extent that we've treated humans as computers or robots, then AIs can replace us. Um, to the extent that we know what our true human worth is, then they can't. Um, so uh, now's the time that we have to step up and understand our true worth as humans and what makes us uniquely human. Um, I'll, I'll just give a, a quick example of this. Uh, most surgery is requires incredible manual dexterity, excellent vision, and an ability to memorize extremely complex procedures in order as that sometimes branch off into what do you do if this happens and what do you do if this happens, okay? Um, and in fact, there are AI-driven models of surgery that allow a surgeon using virtual reality to perform a surgery on a virtual body. And the AI will then actually train the surgeon in the, in the procedures and the branching procedures. These are called expert systems. They're not really AIs. They're called expert systems, not really AIs. But here's the deal. Um, to the extent that surgery is procedure-driven and visual data driven and dexteria driven, it'll be one of the first things replaced by AI robots. Because the robots are getting better and better. 
the vision's getting better and better, and the ability to branch off and know many, many procedures and branching things are getting better and better. And um, already surgery can be done remotely. Um, my friend Pat Fulgham is a urologist who does this remote prostate surgery. Um, yeah, if if a human manipulating gloves and machines can operate on a person who's across the room, then an AI is going to be able to do it. Uh, on the other hand, Nobody coming out of surgery wants to meet a robot. So a number of things in the healthcare profession have said, surgeons may be the first to be replaced and nurses the last. Because there are places where we want humans. That's that, that As a human, that's what we want. We want a human. Um, so we're going to have to come to grips with this. The United States is way behind the curve on this. Every other uh, nation in the world, every other industrialized nation in the world has had policies in place for the last 10 years to deal with job displacement by AI, retraining, refocusing on human ability. Um, uh, Stanford School of Education, a couple of professors there have actually written a book called Humility is the New Smart, um, where they basically say in every industry, the most important thing is going to be human resources because you've got to make effective use of your humans as AI takes over mechanical tasks. But um, but you need humans. We need humans. We just need to understand our value. Um, so um, couldn't you arguably train an LLM on therapy data and conversion and conversation data enable it to simulate a model of mind using predictive capabilities well enough to convince a human that it has a model of mind? It's a really good question. Um, Allison asked this question. It's a really good question. And I will guarantee that people are doing it, including my student, uh, Drew, with his digital shepherd. Um, and the, the answer to this is that as AIs get better and better, uh, especially in terms of, of responding to taking our data as input that can be remembered and added to its environmental under, its understanding of the environment in which it's speaking, then the AI will appear more and more to have a theory of our mind. Okay, um, it's the there's a couple of problems here though um, that limit this. One is we're not sure how our minds store extraordinarily complex memories over a lifetime. So that, that, that we, we smell something and we instantly recall what it was like to be five years old, right? We, um, they, we're not sure how the, the complex way in which this happens. And so it's very uncertain how long um, the most complex chat GPT neural networks will remember a conversation with us um, because we don't know how they're remembering anything, really. It's a black box. Um, so could they do it? Well, they're certainly working on it. And some of these really have the appearance that they have a, 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 a theory of mind. But what's interesting is that if you turn, if you, if you, uh, if you chat with the digital shepherd for 25 minutes and then you quit chatting with it and you come back a week later, it doesn't remember anything about you. <laughs> it doesn't, um, you're, you're starting over. Whereas I would hope that those of you that know Jerry would hope that if you had a conversation a week ago, he would remember it and maybe even one a year and a half ago, and he probably would. <laughs> um, so that's the, certainly AI is not there yet. Um, and it, there's no, it, it can simulate having a theory of mind because it puts words in the order that suggests that because they're coming from humans who have a theory of mind. Um, you mentioned AI can provide a decent or even good written piece of prose or poetry. What are the potential consequences of, to the creative energies of humans if these are so easily available? This is one of the hot issues today. Is AI generated art, AI generated music, um, uh, a, a, a writer and a researcher on AI named Hofstetter, Joseph Hofstetter, uh, this is one of the things that scared him the most about AI taking over as humans. He's a little less scared now. Um, but but here's the thing about this. Um, and I've dabbled a good deal in AI art, and I have friends who've dabbled a good deal more, and poetry, and stuff like this. Um, first of all, uh, 
chat GPT has its own style and it's not a human style and that's recognizable. Okay, especially in essays and sermons and things like this. When it writes poetry or it paints pictures, because it's only been trained on things created by humans, then inevitably it in some respect is a mashup of human styles. Um, and, and that's fairly obvious. Now, some of the stuff is truly beautiful and some of it seems remarkably creative. But there's a second aspect of this. And I was talking, to, I have some friends, I won't say close friends, but they're big donors to our school. <laughs> so they're the kind of people you at least want to smile at. Um, and they are collectors of contemporary art. And they, they're wealthy enough and big enough collectors of contemporary art that they have their own agents in Paris and New York to look for things for them to buy. And she at least has certainly has wonderful taste in this. And so we, I've asked her about this AI generated art. And she said, as a genre of art, she's interested in it. But she made this point. She said, we divide art between in two forms. There's real art and there's decorative art. Decorative art is the stuff you buy as a decoration. You and you hang it in corporate headquarters. Um, you can you can commission decorative art by saying, by the way, there are colors for this corporate world or this and this and this. And you tell the artist, I need something that's 28 inches by 46 inches long. It's a mural. It needs to be abstract and it needs to have these colors so that it blends in with our corporate thing. And artists can create that stuff. So can AI. OK. So what's the difference between decorative art and real art? And the answer is the human story behind it. She says, we don't buy art by computers. We buy art by humans. And when we buy art and pay a lot for it, we want to know the human. We want to know her story. We want to know what, how this came out of her background. We want to know the mind that created it, the narrative account of what created it. And AIs can be asked to create such a narrative account, but they really have a hard time matching the creative account with the actual art because of the process by which they create pictures. Um, because remember, they can't see the picture they create, right? They can't, so they can't imagine the mind that might have created it. That's not the way they work. Um, so I think, I, I think human artists, Musicians, poets, painters um, are not in danger. I will tell you who is in danger because I've already endangered them myself. Um, and that's low-level graphic artists um, who, who put stuff together because a client asks for it. And they happen to have excellent drawing skills and a good sense of color. But they, they are not really creative. And because they're not really creative, they're easily replaced by AI. Um, even a very skilled graphic artist works because, and I've done this a few times, websites and stuff, they have a conversation with you. You talk for an hour. The graphic artist elicits from you your vision and then uses their skills to put this into action. You can do this with an AI, but it's never initiative. So you're constantly having to, to chat with the AI and it'll draw something and you send it back. That's not quite what I want. It's not what I want, you know. It's extremely frustrating because you sense that there's not a mind back there listening to you. Okay. So I don't, I don't think real artists are in trouble, but decorative artists are going to lose their jobs. There's no question that that group of people who are not particularly creative. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of stuff out there now about using AI for creativity. So you use, you, you use AI to, to say, to generate ideas, right? To just then, then, you develop them further, but it, it's, this is the sort of time that's the time that's saved because I'm in a hurry. And I say, I say, G give me 10 pictures that look like, um, something and AI gives me 10. And then if I have the skill, I can, I can then do what's actually creative there. But for someone who's not creative, like myself in terms of painting, then, uh, yeah, I'm using Dolly and chat GPT all the time. Uh, because I need an illustration for a PowerPoint slide. I don't want to spend five years 
doing a Google search through Google Images to find that PowerPoint slide. I can go straight into ChatGPT and say, draw a picture of a robot performing heart surgery. And it'll take two and a half seconds to do it. Will it be a great picture? No, but I'm putting it in a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, <laughs> who, who cares? I, I don't need art. I need an eye filler, eye candy. AI will do eye candy. Um, okay. Uh, a famous quote by George Bernard Shaw. Um, but by the way, I don't, the best case scenario, Susan, is this, that what AI will do is release our creative imagery, images, our creative energies, that it will give us the leisure to be creative and take away, we have a prayer in the Methodist church, free us from grinding toil that destroys the fullness of life. There's all kinds of grinding toil. Robots, farm machinery, washing machines, these have all relieved us of a lot of grinding toil. But I can tell you, for, for me as an academic, the grinding toil for me is write a one-paragraph summary of the sermon because it needs to go in the bulletin. That's grinding toil. So you know what? I feed the term in the chat GPT, and I say, based on this sermon, give me the five most important minutes that I can use for the podcast. Give me a one paragraph summary for the church newsletter. Give me an outline of it that can be distributed to the Sunday school classes with five discussion questions. And give me two pictures that I can put up on the PowerPoint. ChatGPT 4.0 will do all of that and will save me spending five hours in my office so that I can now go and spend those five hours visiting the hospital and doing human things with humans. Okay. A famous quote by George Bernard Shaw, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has actually taken place. Oh, I love that. <laughs> um, okay, we'll leave it at that. That's a wonderful comment. Um, can you please speak to what it means for our humanity that so much of our sense of purpose and human worth is tied up in our jobs and our work in the modern era? If we redefine our sense of purpose, it seems we might not feel so threatened by AI. I agree. Um, a philosopher named Piper wrote a book, influential book in the 1960s called Leisure as the Basis of Civilization. And he basically says what happens in the agrarian society of Greece, to, he's using just a modern, a Western example, we can find the same examples in India and China, is that in ancient Greece, just before the time of Aristotle and Plato, um, farmers begin to produce an excess of what they need to eat so that they can support a class of people who don't have to farm. And it's those people who have time to think, to create sculptures and art. The, the excess of, of the productive production of the necessities of life gives us the leisure to be civilized and to be creative and to think. And I think uh, that this is, um, this is where we have to discover our humanity that our humanity consists in our being humans for others, in thinking creatively, of expressing things creatively that come out of our own emotions and feelings and are not just a regurgitation of a mashup of what humans have done before. And if we can get in touch with creativity and thinking and contemplation as being of fundamental values, then we are not gonna need to be threatened by AI. But yes, if economic productivity is what we think we were created to do in this world, then we're absolutely doomed. AI is going to be more creative than we are. It is going to be more economically productive than we are. Um, and by the way, used properly and unregulated, it will concentrate power and wealth in the hands of the few, as it, as it is already beginning to do. Um, so, that, so as a church, we need to teach people to be human. We need to get back to learning 
what it means to be human. I don't want to be preaching your sermon, Jerry, but <laughs> look, <laughs> we concentrate so much as Christians on the fact that Jesus was God. We forget that he was the new Adam. Theology is way less important than understanding the restoration of humanity through Christ. God was unchanging. The fact that Jesus, that God came as a human being wasn't so we would know a great deal more about God. It was so we'd understand ourselves again, that we could recover our human selves. And we're in a phase where we need to do that. That's the meaning of salvation. We have to recover our human selves. Um, and by all means, then quit thinking of ourselves as computers. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny you say that, Doctor. And so right. when, when I took Old Testament from Heller, from Dr. Roy Heller, I'll never forget a quote that he started the whole class with um, in our first session is he told us that, and I've used it several times and I've given him credit, that we don't need a big book to tell us what God is like. Even yeah. a, thir a third grader understands that, right? Yeah. What God is. God is everlasting love. God is slow to anger, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He said, what you need a big book for is to understand who you are. Yeah. So you, say, you know what I mean? And so it, I, yeah. I don't know why that resonated with me when you said that, right? Like we spend a lot of time trying to read the Bible to try to figure out, you know, what is God like and all this stuff when really, you know, maybe one of the major purposes of scripture is it teaches us to understand ourselves and how we relate to each other and how we conceive of a creator and how we relate yeah. with that creator. But it it's really centered on how we learn about who we are um, in, in, yeah. in this world. I, th I think so. And I think this is where we do. There's a great place. And I, if I've mentioned it before, hit me. I'm teaching five courses that this material covers. Um, in the in the Star Wars universe of shows, there's one called Andor. I may have mentioned this before. Andor is about a character who appears in the Star Wars movies, but this is his backstory. And, um, and it's the story of how he ends up joining the Rebellion really. Uh, it's one of the best of the series that have been done for this, but there's there's a moment in it that is really, it's reaching a climax. Andor and a lot of other people have been essentially enslaved in a factory making machines for the Empire. And this, this character Andor um, is talking to this group of men who are just constantly being pushed, do more, move, create this, do this, do this, do this, until they literally drop dead and then they're hauled off um, and replaced by another one and another human. And Andor looks at them all and says, you realize they're only using humans because we're cheaper than robots. We're doing robot work, but we're cheaper than robots, okay? Now, if the only reason our workplace is using us is because we're cheaper than robots, then there's a problem with our understanding of who we are. We need to get out of that enslavement. We need to be doing what humans do. Um, and, uh, and we do have, we have to explore what is our uniqueness in this world? What are our unique capabilities? What, you know, what are we that without sight and without hearing, merely by human touch, we can recreate within ourselves the whole of the world and learn to speak in language like Helen Keller could? That's miraculous. Okay. But by the way, I say merely by touch, merely by human touch. Because the touch between Helen Keller and, the, and her teacher was the touch of a human that knew there was a mind in there and who through touch could convey, I see you, I see you seeing me, I see you seeing me seeing you. That's, that, is, that is absolutely beyond the imagination of what we could do with an AI. And, it's, and that's because, by the way, just to go back, we know what they are. We know how they're made physically. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I think any other questions? I don't, you know, I think we're probably past the time that we've contracted to be together with one another.
Oh, we're fine. We've got seven minutes left. So oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I there was one interesting thing that that you said though. It's interesting when you were making. I, I think the best description that I've heard so far is this idea of qualia and the difference between real art mm -hmm. and decorative art. I mean, it kind of assumes that that as humans, when we look at a thing, like even if it's an architectural structure, like a magnificent sure. church or something like that, that the qualia of that human being that created that edifice or that piece of art, mm -hmm. that there's a piece of it now in that structure yeah. that we can discern, right? And that's right. what we want to connect to. It's not just that it's beautiful or that it's you know amazing to look at or amazing to think about how it was created there's something of that qualia embedded in that thing now yeah. or at least we perceive there is and that's what we're really attracted to and from right. what you're saying that qualia is not a characteristic that an ai can embed in anything in a piece of literature that it writes or a picture or whatever, or if it does, we can sense that it's one dimensional, right? That it's based on a one dimensional experience and that, and we're like, uh, okay. Yeah. So. I, th I think that's right. And we're, you know, it's one, one way to think about this is that um, we can be fooled. Okay. Um, a, a AI can do this, <laughs> but a very skilled human artist can react can can paint a copy of a Picasso that is so well done that experts, without short of analyzing the canvas chemically and stuff, can't tell that it's not the real thing. And yet the minute we know it's a copy, it has no value. Okay. The minute we know it's a copy, it has no value because the value of a Picasso is linked to the human person, Picasso, who created it. Its, its value comes only from that link, not from its visual appearance. Its visual appearance is easily copied. It comes from that link to Picasso. I've got a picture hanging on our wall in the kitchen. It is an interesting southern, southwestern landscape, clouds, sky, this sort of thing. Um, uh, it's, it is in the style of very well-known artist who painted these kind of landscapes, but it's almost certainly not by this artist. It's not signed. Um, it's not actually particularly my taste in art, but it's hanging in my dining room. So why is it hanging in my dining room? Because it was owned by my mother. And it wasn't just owned by my mother, but it was owned by my mother who bought it at an auction because it looked like something that she liked by this artist, even though she wasn't sure he painted it, but it was for sure hand painted. It's not a print. Okay. It has a story. It has a backstory. It's value lies entirely in the backstory. Okay. And um, that's, that's going to be the difference. Uh, we can create fake, fake backstories and people do, we can create imitation art, but the minute we know it's imitation, it has no value. Because its value comes it's exactly as you say, Jerry, from the qualia, the experience of the artist. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm, oh wait, there may be another question here. I better, I better scroll down. I think that's uh, oh, I love that, Jerry. Yeah, <laughs> that's a comment actually. That's a comment. Good <laughs> on you, Jerry. Thank yeah. you, Allison. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right, friends, with this, you got about another three minutes with Dr. Hunt. So are there any more questions, any more questions that anybody would like to ask or, or type in before we end our time together? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm clicking off these that have been okay. done in a sense. Okay, yeah, so I, I don't see any questions, but I will now. Any other questions? We're going to give you one minute to type this. And while they're thinking of that, I just want to... Say thank you again, Dr. Hunt, for all of your time um, and helping us with this. It's been um, a joy. Um, I've gotten lots and lots of positive feedback um, from our time together. Um, people going are going back and looking at the recordings um, pretty regularly. So that's, that's a good indication of um, how invested people are in our conversation. So thank you. Um, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. And you guys have given me a, one, your questions have been very helpful to me. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a book about this.
um, uh, was commissioned by a publisher. And so uh, you guys have really helped me as I formulate some things. And as I look at the questions you ask to see kind of what works and what doesn't work and where I said way too much and where I need to maybe say more. All right. Well, with that, then it doesn't look like there's any other questions. I want to thank all of you for jumping in and staying with us. Like I said before, I will have recordings of all these sessions posted in a YouTube playlist for everyone, and we'll get that out. And again, Dr. Hunt, thank you so much. Um, it's just been wonderful to spend time with you again. So thank you. Thanks again, Jerry. I appreciate right. it. Forward to the next opportunity. All right. We'll see you later. Bye. Good night, all.